Hello, I'm Bob McEwen. Welcome to the Fifth Estate. It is a tale of almost mythic proportions, of a hero who overcomes unlikely roots and a deadly disease to dominate his sport as no one ever had before. And make no mistake about it, Lance Armstrong had everything, glory and fame and fortune, as well as the critics insisting it was all too good to be true. The Armstrong story is either one of remarkable success or an astounding fall from grace or, as you're about to see, both. It was the year 2000 when Lance Armstrong arrived in the ancient city of Girona in Spain. He moved onto this narrow stone street, buying the apartment on the second floor, behind front doors, 20 feet high. The world's top bike racer had come from France, where he was a hero but where the police and the press were increasingly fixated on the use of drugs in cycling. The Spanish seemed far more relaxed about it all. It's why earlier that same year, Armstrong and his teammates came to a hotel in Spain to have blood drawn from their bodies, to be kept for transfusions when they needed a boost of fresh blood cells at the next Tour de France. Doping, perhaps, but with your own blood, virtually undetectable. For someone who would earn over $20 million a year riding his bike, there were secrets to keep behind the walls of this former medieval palace. Look at this now, Armstrong is absolutely flying here. He has achieved yet another page in this fairy story that just goes on. The story of how Lance Armstrong got here, the legend larger than life, and the dizzying descent back to Earth begins not in one of cycling's European hotspots, but in the bike racing backwater of Texas. Young Lance grew up without a father, but with a hard-working mom, a talent for sports, and the mental toughness to succeed at punishing events like the triathlon. Eventually, he would abandon the swimming and running to become US national champion on two wheels. And by the early 90s, barely into his 20s, Armstrong was ready to test himself against the very best at the pinnacle of professional cycling in Europe and in the biggest race of all, the Tour de France. Armstrong has the advantage here. He's on the right side of these riders. But even for a highly touted newcomer like Armstrong, the Tour de France would be a struggle. In his first four attempts, overall, his best result was 36th place. He had never really been a, an overall contender. He had won stages, individual stages, but um, he just never really had it in the in the in the big mountains in the Alps in the Pyrenees. He had never had that um, that ability to climb with the best. Fellow American Tyler Hamilton came to Europe to win a job in the peloton, the pack of riders who are the supporting cast for stars like Lance Armstrong. Let's just say I was getting killed, fighting to be, you know, in the middle of the pack, you know, naturally. It was soon clear to him that many of the European pros had an unnatural advantage. There wasn't a whole lot of news about doping, but once in a while it would pop up. But yeah, it was in the back of my mind that it was out there. To what degree, I didn't know. I didn't know if it was if it was five percent or ten percent, or you know, later I learned it was probably closer to 80%. Doping, the use and abuse of drugs, has always been integral to the sport of cycling. As far back as the 1920s, two French brothers, early Tour de France heroes, died from doping complications, as have dozens of other elite racers in the decades since. According to David Walsh of London's Sunday Times, doping in cycling has evolved from stimulants to substances much more sophisticated. Drugs like cortisone and I think steroids and testosterone became, you know, drugs that, that people used a lot. It was definitely cheating and it was definitely um, wrong. Um, but I don't believe that it, it, it was as corrupt as the EPO uh, doping would be. EPO is a term you'll hear a lot in our report. It's shorthand for the drug erythropoietin, 
one function of which is to increase the production of red blood cells, which carry oxygen throughout the body. The more oxygen, the more endurance, which is why EPO is the drug of choice in cycling. When you arrived, was this a decision you thought you would have to make, to dope or not to dope? You know, the learning curve was very steep. Um, and yeah, the doping part just came, I guess, came naturally. The, all of a sudden, you know, a doc, the team doctor approached me and, you know, the, re the rest is history. What he took first was testosterone to speed up his post-race recovery. Then the doctor suggested something else injections of EPO to increase stamina. Any qualms Hamilton had took a back seat to what the EPO might mean for his career. When he approached me with the EPO, it was almost like being, uh, being invited into a fraternity. You know, it was like, I, f I felt like I was on the B team at the start of the year and it was almost like I was being invited into the A team. <laughs> He has been a great one-day rider right from the beginning, but it remains to be seen whether he can do the biggest stage races, such as the Tour de France. Journalist David Walsh says Lance Armstrong would ultimately make his own decision. I think Lance embraced the challenge of doping and, and, and soon turned it into an opportunity. In other words, well, imagine if we could dope more intelligently than everybody else. Several years later, in a deposition for a civil lawsuit over bonus money, Armstrong seemed evasive when asked about the drug climate of the 1990s. Doping in sport has existed since the original Olympic Games, so hypothetically, could you say that? Yeah. Well, not hypothetically. I, I appreciate that testimony. I'm talking about not actually during that time period. Do people test positive sometimes? Yes. After the break, the making of the myth of Lance Armstrong. He's a chameleon. He will be whom he wants you to see, what he wants you to feel. For American cyclist Tyler Hamilton, if you wanted to compete with the best in the world, the ultimatum was simple, use drugs or go home. He says that didn't make it easier. The whole moral part of it, I just try to push it in the back of my head and, and not think about it, you know? Everybody, Mike, I'd always go back to everybody else is doing it, it's, it's what I gotta do. And the answer's out of the box. Reporter David Walsh says by this point, Armstrong's teammates saw indications he was doing it too. The physical transformation from a live cyclist to a linebacker on wheels. His physique changed completely, much stronger. He built himself up, much more muscular, and everybody was astonished. Now, he, he had started working with Michele Ferrari at that time, so Ferrari basically was, was, was starting to create a quite different you know, athlete. Armstrong's new Italian physician, Dr. Michele Ferrari, had a reputation in cycling circles. Though he denied giving EPO to his riders, he defended those who did, arguing it was no more dangerous than drinking orange juice. But there were suspicions about his training methods and a nickname, Dr. Evil. Over 10 years, Armstrong would pay Ferrari about a million dollars. Did you believe at that time we started going to see him in the mid-90s that he had a, what would be considered a bad or unpopular reputation? Oh, I think, I think in those days, anybody who, who rode fast or performed well had a questionable reputation, which hasn't changed to this day. Whatever the speculation about Lance Armstrong's reputation, in the fall of 1996, everything would change when he was diagnosed with advanced testicular cancer, which had spread to his chest and brain. On Wednesday, October 2nd, I was diagnosed with testicular cancer. Told he might not live, that he might never race again, seemed a reasonable conclusion. All the reports we were getting at the time was that it was serious. So 
yeah, I mean, you, you know, you wondered first, would he be, would he be okay? And then you thought, let's hope he can get back and have a career. Longtime friend and fellow rider Frankie Andreo and his then fiance Betsy went to the hospital in Indianapolis along with other Armstrong friends and family. He had a private room and it was very small, so we couldn't fit the six of us in that room. So we went to a conference room where he had a scheduled meeting with his doctors. They offered to leave, but Armstrong insisted they stay. What Betsy Andreo heard next was the first glimpse of his doping program to someone outside the inner circle. The doctors asked some banal questions, and then it came out, have you ever used any performance-enhancing drugs? And I mean, Lance was holding his IV and then just nonchalantly rattled off EPO, growth hormone, testosterone, cortisone, steroids. My eyes popped out of my head, and Frankie saw I was upset. We excused ourselves from the room immediately. And I turned to Frankie and I said, if you are doing that, I am not marrying you. Betsy Andreo says she mentally filed away what she had heard at the hospital, for now. According to Frankie, sometime later, Armstrong brought the subject up during a training run. He kind of asked about how Betsy reacted to what happened in the hospital room. What did you tell him? I said she freaked out a little bit, and you know we got in a couple arguments, but then kind of went away. Did he respond or say anything further about it? No, it was very short. But almost a decade later, after those accusations were made public, under oath, Lance Armstrong denied any of it ever took place. How could it have taken place when I've never taken performance-enhancing drugs? Look, how could that have happened? That was my point. You're not, it's not just simply you don't recall, just... I, how many times do I have to say it? I'm just trying to make sure your testimony is clear. Well, if it can't be any clearer than I've never taken drugs, then incidents like that could never have happened. Okay. How clear is that? He's a chameleon. Uh, he will be whom he wants you to see, what he wants you to feel. If he wants to use you, if he needs something from you, he will be charming. He will charm the heck out of you. If he wants you to shut up, if he wants to send a message, he will be threatening and intimidating. And we've seen both ends. Before I was diagnosed, I was competing as a professional cyclist. Whatever happened in that hospital room, what would happen next is one of the great tales of the strength of the human spirit. Incredibly, within a year, Lance Armstrong would recover from surgery, defeat his cancer, and establish his own charity to help others fight the disease as well. What's more, miraculously it seemed, he was riding again. Nobody knew if he'd come back, and then I think it was uh, late in the year in 1997, you know, I learned that Lance Armstrong was gonna be my teammate, and that was, that was really exciting. On the front now, Tyler Hamilton with his jersey ripped open because it is very hot today in the Pyrenees. And he was a hero to me. And all of a sudden, yeah, we're teammates and sometimes even roommates. And Tyler Hamilton was also about to be a witness to one of the darkest moments in cycling history. Et je remercie le, le public qui a été très, très... It was the eve of the 1998 Tour de France, which Lance Armstrong would not ride. Police pulled over a car belonging to the top-ranked French cycling team Festina. Inside were hundreds of drug doses, testosterone, cortisone, amphetamines, human growth hormone, and of course, EPO. Antoine Valle was one of the Festina coaches. Though it's acknowledged he had nothing to do with doping, he saw the immediate impact of the raid. All the police came, the manager was, was in jail during one week and everybody was, uh, everybody was arrested. Some riders, uh, people of the staff, and uh, they speak, uh, what is it, uh, what are you doing, uh, who takes that, where does it come from, and so on.
And the French police raided other Tour de France teams too. So the police then move in on the race and everywhere they go, they unearth huge quantities of drugs. It seemed like every team was doping. But if the Festina affair caused some sober second thought about drugs in cycling, it wasn't for long. When you are 25 years old, you think you are immortal, and the risk is okay. The, the mentality is, all what, I'm, all what I can take, I take. Well, what a big difference a year has made. Last year, we regularly brought reports of police raids on the event and riders being involved in drug scandals. Now, the Tour de France in 1999 was Lance Armstrong's first since his cancer. In the start house now is Lance Armstrong. Organizers claimed that after Festina, it was also the beginning of a new drug-free era, though that remained to be seen. Was the use of performance-enhancing drugs, to your knowledge, by other cyclists, fairly common in 99 or 2000? Um, if you know. Well, yeah, and cycling was rocked in 1998 by, by Festina, so that... I think if anybody didn't understand that there was uh, some sort of a doping problem with some teams in cycling after 1998, then they had their head in the ground. Now back to the race, and now just beginning the climb here. Armstrong's comeback in 1999 was news around the world, held as a symbol of what could be done without doping, because surely no one could suspect after what he had been through, he would put anything illicit in his body. It is an epic climb. It is a climb that has gone down in very many legendary stories. Then came the day of the first big climb. He's out of the saddle, sprinting up this climb now. He's trying to... Really Former coach Antoine Valle describes that performance as superhuman, meaning EPO must have been involved. When Armstrong climbed the hill and he was uh, pedaling like a sprint, like if it was a descent, and he had to pull on his brake before the bend. Uh, and he's flying up this mountain. A physical and mental delivery here by Lance Armstrong to all of his rivals in the Tour de France. I remember being in the press room uh, on the day of Sestrier, and a lot of the journalists were looking at it, looking at big, big screen and TV, and Lance was riding away from everybody. This man has managed to come back from the face of death, and now he's riding at the front of the Tour de France like a Trojan. And they were laughing. They were just looking up and kind of going, <laughs> look at that joke. They're telling us, to, 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 they're trying to tell us that the Tour is clean. Did you see that? I mean, this is, this is ridiculous. And that's what a competing rider said too. Christophe Besson of France was known for speaking out against doping. In a French newspaper, he said he and other riders were shocked by Armstrong's superhuman climb. One day he wrote about that it looked like there was doping in the peloton just due to the, due to the speeds. And, um, I think Lance was in the, in the leading the tour. He was in the yellow jersey. And he didn't like that. The next day, Tyler Hamilton saw an infuriated Armstrong ride up to Besson in the middle of the race and scream at him to shut up about doping or quit. Lance kind of, you know, within the peloton, he spread the word that, you know, we don't need this guy in, in our group anymore. And he was quickly isolated in the group, you know, and there's 200 guys. It's like a big family, 200 riders. And he got most of the guys to kind of gang up on him and not talk to him. And, he, he all of a sudden just left the tour. And so sad, so sad. Hamilton says the incident established Armstrong's place as cycling's alpha male. You know, the guys in the peloton saw that and they, they saw his power and like, you know, guys were scared of him, that's for sure. He, you know, if you didn't have anything nice to say about him, you just kept your mouth shut. You didn't want to cross Lance Armstrong. <laughs> And the rain starts again as Lance Armstrong... In 1999, in that first Tour de France victory, Lance Armstrong would have 15 urine samples taken. None tested positive for doping, at least not yet. But questions were being raised. This man, Lance Armstrong, is still having to deny the fact he is not taking drugs in this Tour de France, and the press are saying he is. And I can emphatically say I'm not on drugs. It's unfortunate that the yellow jersey of the Tour de France always has to defend drugs or, you know, or, or say something about drugs, but 
C'est la vie. So now he is going to cross the line. I think this will be some victory salute. Lance Armstrong was now on his way to becoming one of the richest, most recognizable sportsmen in the world. His story an inspiration to millions. Lance Armstrong, only the second American cyclist ever, and the even as his tour-winning U.S. postal team celebrated in Paris, for Armstrong's teammates, there was often anxiety and fear. When we return. Frankie wasn't one of Lance's lemmings because he was the only guy who had the courage to tell Lance no. For the winner of the Tour de France in that big field is the American Lance Armstrong. After his miraculous comeback from cancer and triumphant return to the Tour de France, Lance Armstrong was one of the biggest celebrities in the world. He wins the tour by a massive margin. Hobnobbing with presidents. Hanging out in Hollywood. <laughs> dating a rock star. His autobiography, It's Not About the Bike, was a phenomenal bestseller. His Livestrong Foundation would raise hundreds of millions of dollars to fight cancer and would make the wristband a universal symbol of hope. Armstrong's earnings would amount to well over $20 million a year with commercial endorsements for cars, beer, and his biggest sponsor, Nike. Everybody wants to know what I'm on. What am I on? I'm on my bike, busting my ass six hours a day. What are you on? Nobody believes in doping controls more than me. I've, and wherever he went, he took the message that against all odds, he'd accomplished everything drug-free. The proof for the results, not just the race results, but the drug testing results, the investigations, the inquiries, the court cases, haven't lost one of them. You wrote that Lance Armstrong was doping. You were, you were likely to be sued, and nobody was going to believe you because you were talking about, you know, because he wins the tour brilliant he's recovered you know he has recovered from cancer great job wins the toughest race in the world extraordinary wins it in the most brilliant way but behind the scenes it was a different story insiders knew that even after cancer armstrong was still working with the man known as dr evil italian physician michaela ferrari if somebody thinks ferrari they're seeing ferrari for one reason and one reason alone and that's to get on a doping program. It became this open secret in cycling that everybody knew. Is there anything about your dealings with Dr. Ferrari over the decade or so that you've known him and dealt with him that would suggest to you that perhaps he was using or encouraging mm -hmm. other athletes to use performance enhancing drugs or substances? No, in fact, to the contrary. Tell me what you mean by that, to the contrary. He's the I know, I know you're, you're going to find this hard to believe, but he's, to me, uh, totally clean and totally ethical, believes in, in clean, fair sport, um, but produces great results with his athletes because he's, he's so focused. Betsy Andreo's husband, Frankie, was Lance Armstrong's friend and teammate, while Michaela Ferrari was his trainer and doctor. She says riders were constantly pressured to do whatever necessary to help Armstrong win or lose their job, as Frankie Andrea ultimately did. They lumped Frankie in with the rest of them. And the truth of the matter is, Frankie wasn't one of Lance's lemmings because he was the only guy who had the courage to tell Lance, no, not once, not twice, more. No, I'm not saying Ferrari. I'm not getting on a doping program. Don't go there with me. And he paid the price. Tyler Hamilton would also have an intimate view of the dark chapter of doping history that was being written. He says among teammates, Armstrong didn't try to hide it. After a while, it became just kind of normal conversation. Armstrong apparently felt so secure about his doping regimen that he kept a supply of EPO at home in the refrigerator. I asked him if he had any spare EPO because my, you know, I hadn't taken it in, in a long time. And as a good friend and as a good teammate, he, he offered it up and it was, yeah, just on the inside of his refrigerator on the, on the 
on the door, you know, just right in the box and pretty, pretty much right there out, out. Front and center. Front and center, yeah. He says the doping continued, even increased, for Armstrong and his U.S. postal team. Tyler Hamilton's education in doping was about to move to a whole new level. Shortly before the Tour de France in the year 2000, he got a visit from Lance Armstrong and their team manager, who told him they were all going to take a trip to make some final preparations before the big race. That was when they made their first journey to the hotel in Spain to collect those bags of blood to be banked until the Tour de France. Then, when they needed it most, a bag of their own fresh blood would be returned by transfusion, full of new red blood cells. Lance Armstrong has repeatedly denied it all. Do you have any knowledge as to whether or not Tyler Hamilton was using illegal substances while he was your teammate? Not that I ever saw. But everyone in cycling was about to see a dramatic change. For years, doping researchers had been working on a test to detect DPO. Dr. Michael Ashenden of Australia was one of them. We wanted to introduce a test that the authorities could then use and apply to get rid of the drug cheats. I mean, you know, EPO was rampant back then. It was, it was everywhere. And so we had to put some kind of a barrier in, in the way of the athletes who were using it. And, you know, the, the test, whether it was based on blood or urine, was a way to put that barrier in there and, and, and put a break on things. I'm not trying to apply anything by this. I'm just trying to find out this, your state of mind with respect mm -hmm. to what you know is being tested for. That's all. Mm -hmm. um, well, what's interesting, yeah, you know, I think it would be fair to say that in 2000, for example, they didn't have the EPO test perfected. So perhaps athletes could have taken EPO and gotten away with it. Indeed, when Lance Armstrong went on to win the 2000 Tour de France, his second consecutive triumph, all his drug tests in the race were negative. Then came the 2001 season. It was at a warm-up event for the Tour de France in Switzerland. As a top rider, as usual, Armstrong was required to give a post-race urine sample. What happened then was anything but usual. I believe it was the morning of stage nine, and Lance had told me that he had a, just had a positive test for EPO. Um, what went through your mind? Uh, I mean, I was shocked. I was shocked. I was, you know, sc scared. This was going to most likely just finish the team, you know. The most likely this team sponsor would have pulled out immedi immediately. We were, we were two weeks away from starting the 2001 Tour de France, trying to help Lance win his third Tour de France, and, you know, it was going to be all, all over. From its headquarters here in Switzerland, cycling's governing body, the International Cycling Union, commonly known by its French initials, the UCI, administers the sports doping control program. The rules may be hard and fast, but it seems for Lance Armstrong, there was room to negotiate. He quickly kind of laughed it off and said, hey, it's gonna be, it's all, it's all good. It's gonna be taken care of. You know, basic bottom line, it was swept under the rug. A positive test for EPO should have required a two year suspension, but those test results weren't revealed and no action against Lance Armstrong was ever taken. Many believe the International Cycling Union saw their superstar, the key to the North American market, as a crucial asset to be protected. So did almost everyone, except David Walsh. All the peloton are on Armstrong's side. The sponsors are on Armstrong's side. The Tour de France organization is on Armstrong's side. And the journalists, of course, were on Armstrong's side, most of all. And I remember thinking, I don't care. I'm not, I'm not applauding this guy because it just, it just doesn't feel right. Walsh set out to prove that the world's top cyclist, a legend and leader in the fight against cancer, was not what he appeared to be. When we come back. In my view, I, I think extraordinary accusations must be followed up with extraordinary proof.
It was the eve of the 2004 Tour de France, the one Lance Armstrong needed to set the all-time record for most consecutive tour wins. It was also the day David Walsh published his new book, L.A. Confidential, the most in-depth investigation of Armstrong and drugs and cycling ever. At the pre-race news conference, the book was topic number one. Your former team member, Stephen Swart, tells in the book L.A. Confidential uh, stories about uh, the using of APO in your team. It's a fact. What's your comment on that? Uh, no comment. No comment here, perhaps. But Armstrong's lawyers were already suing Walsh and his publisher. In Britain, they even filed suit against the Sunday Times, which dared to write about the book. The Times was forced to apologize. L.A. Confidential was only ever published in French, and it all put a chill in the coverage of Lance Armstrong. At that news conference for the 2004 Tour de France, Armstrong ridiculed L.A. Confidential and David Walsh. I, I, I'll, I'll say one thing about the book, and especially since our uh, esteemed author is here. In my view, I, I think extraordinary accusations must be followed up with extraordinary proof. And Mr. Walsh and Mr. Ballester have worked four or five years, and they have not come up with extraordinary proof. What do you think about the I'm not done. Sorry. The case is now in incredibly complicated and will be a long one. I have engaged lawyers in both France and England. Um, I will spend whatever it takes, however long it takes, to bring justice to the case. But for the first time, LA Confidential reported the experiences of Armstrong insiders, many of whom later gave depositions in that civil suit. Like postal team staffer Emma O'Reilly, who described helping Lance Armstrong disguise a syringe mark on his body. How is it he asked you to, to apply makeup or give makeup? What happened? Well, he applied it, but he just asked me, did I have any makeup to kind of cover up a bruise mark? Did Mr. Armstrong tell you how he got the bruise? He said it was from a syringe mark. Armstrong has consistently dismissed all the insiders who've spoken out as disgruntled people with problems. He told people I was literally crazy, unhinged, um, really fat, very ugly, doesn't know what Frankie sees in me. Frankie's just backing me up. Why, why would Mr. Andrew say the same things, if you know? Uh, um, probably to support his wife, which I don't know if you're married or not, but I am sometimes is required. Is it your testimony that Mr. Andrew was also lying when he said that he heard you say those things regarding your priorities? One hundred percent. But I feel for him. What do you mean by that? Well, I, I think he's trying to back up his old lady. This is what you were up against because Lance had this huge myth. He, it was a myth. It, it was never, ever, ever reality. And it's what he wanted people to believe. And that's why they believed what they believed. Lance Armstrong's amazing record at the Tour de France would come to an end in 2005, when he won his seventh consecutive title, then announced his retirement. Lance Armstrong salutes the crowd, seven times a winner of the Tour de France. But the charges that he did it with drugs didn't disappear. In fact, more damning information began coming out. For example, we told you about the race in Switzerland in 2001, when Tyler Hamilton says Lance Armstrong admitted a drug test suggested he'd used EPO. If true, that's an automatic suspension. But that result was never revealed, and no action against Armstrong was ever taken. We may now know why. In the wake of that suspicious test, Lance Armstrong made a secret financial donation to the International Cycling Union. In all, $125,000 to be used, incredibly, 
to buy a new blood testing machine. The International Cycling Union denies any improper relationship. But doping researcher Michael Ashen isn't buying it. All of this only became known several years later. And so when you have a suspicious result, the sport notifying the athlete and the athlete paying money to the sport, obviously it, it raises question. Despite Lance Armstrong's protests of innocence, consider this. During his first Tour de France victory in 1999, he was drug tested 15 times. None tested positive for EPO. But that was before there was an effective test for EPO. For years, those same urine samples were kept at a lab in France. When an EPO test finally was developed, they were retested. 160297 is the code number for Lance Armstrong. This time, of the 15 samples with that code number, six tested positive for EPO. The question was, with Lance Armstrong now retired, would it all simply be forgotten? David Walsh refused to let that happen. I do have a vendetta against anybody who's a cheat, a liar, a bully, uh, defrauding the public, especially defrauding the public on you know, presenting yourself to the cancer community as one kind of person when you are another kind of person. In 2010, the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency, the USADA, announced an investigation into the doping activities of Lance Armstrong and his team. Released in the fall of 2012, the report seems to be the tipping point for public perception and Lance Armstrong himself. A thousand pages of documents and the testimony of 11 teammates exposing what's called the most sophisticated, professionalized, and successful doping program that sport has ever seen. Cycling indeed has endured a lot of pain as it has absorbed the impact of the USADA report. And at last, the International Cycling Union took action. UCI will ban Lance Armstrong from cycling, and UCI will strip him of his seven Tour de France titles. Lance Armstrong has no place in cycling. Tyler Hamilton believes the sad legacy of the Armstrong era is that everyone at the highest level of cycling now is under suspicion, as they should be. Would it be possible to stop doping and still be competitive, especially in the Tour de France? To me, I think it would have been possible to, you know, uh, you know, to finish the Tour de France, but you know, maybe in the middle somewhere, 80th, 90th. Win the Tour de France. Not a chance. In my eight years of doing the Tour de France, not a, none of those years, not a chance. Do you believe that to win the Tour de France, one must dope? Of course. His lawyer called it a witch hunt, but from Lance Armstrong, there have been no more protests of innocence or adamant denials. It's been a difficult couple of weeks for me, for my family, for my friends, for this foundation. He has announced he will not contest the USADA report or the lifetime ban, and he's cut all ties to his Livestrong charity. To date, this deposition is the only time he's ever told his story under oath. If you'll state your name for us, please. Lance Armstrong, Mr. Armstrong. The USADA report described much of what Lance Armstrong said here as perjury. But then there's this statement. Today, it's like an eerie prediction that may now be coming true. If you have a doping offense or you test positive, it goes without saying that you're fired from all of your contracts, not just the team, but there's numerous contracts that I have that would all go away. Sponsorship agreements, for example. All of them. Uh, um... And the faith of all the cancer survivors around the world, so everything I do off of the bike would go away too. And don't think for a second, I don't understand that. Much of Lance Armstrong's recent communication has been on Twitter, posting this photograph of himself in front of the yellow victor's jerseys from the Tour de France. Trophies no longer rightfully his. What should Lance do? Um, he needs 
to admit what he did because until he does, he does that, he cannot really move forward with his life in any kind of satisfactory way. As long as he says, I wrote clean, all this is a lie, well then he's just, he's living in that fantasy land, which becomes like a prison. The next chapter in the saga of Lance Armstrong is likely to be played out in court after the revelations of the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency report, the Tour de France has demanded he return the $4 million in prize money he received for those seven consecutive victories. And there's a lawsuit over the $12 million in bonuses he got. And recently, a criminal complaint has been filed against the International Cycling Union for fraud and libel on behalf of all the whistleblowers who are called liars for telling the truth about Lance Armstrong. Stay with us. We'll be right back. And that's our program for this week. I'm Bob McEwen. For everyone at the Fifth Estate, thank you for watching. We'll see you soon.